I mean, it seems like the changes are fairly minimal. What's, what's the purpose of dedicating so much time to it? Well, it's our constitutional obligation. That's one thing we have to do is pass a budget, and we want to do a smart budget and do it well and have it make sense. And so um, whether we're adopting amendments um, we, or, or not, we have to make sure that they align with the philosophies of the, and the desires of the people of Alaska. So it, you know, it's, a, it's a process, but it's actually driven by what, what the needs of Alaska are. Becky Bohr with the Associated Press. Um, as you know, there are um, folks uh, in the building and, and Alaskans who say, uh, don't come after the PFD and don't tax until the budget is right-sized. Um, maybe for Representative Seaton um, to start, are, are you comfortable with the budget, understanding their amendments still, but are, are you comfortable with where we're at right now that you could tell your constituents this is a, a right-sized government and you know we we need to have taxes and we need to do a dividend change are you comfortable with making that argument with the budget that you have now um i am we've got 4.2 billion dollars uh, in um, ugf um, funding and so we are on the small side um, of budgets but um you know We've listened to Alaskans, and Alaskans tell us that this is about where they want to see Alaska be. They don't want to see class sizes of 42. They don't want to see more trooper posts closed. They don't want to see roads waiting uh, two more days before they're plowed. And so if those are the desires of the people of Alaska, that's what the budget is doing. And so um, I think that we've, we've heard from a number of people that you know, we are constrained about as far as uh, they want us to go. And so now is the time to look for a comprehensive, sustainable fiscal plan that will uh, produce the Alaska that we want to live in. And, and Becky, to just respond to that, I can say that, um, you know, this budget is essentially the same size as the budget that the Republican majorities had af have, have offered before in the past. Uh, we haven't seen any changes, uh, although the, the Senate says that they want to cut a lot from the budget, cut from education, cut from maintenance, cut from police. Uh, we haven't seen that forwarded yet to the, to the House. Uh, our House uh, believes that, uh, you know, the, the budget, we reduced $100 million from this budget. Um, that's a that's a that's a tough thing to do in the climate that we're at when uh, school teachers are getting laid off, when uh, maintenance is not being done on roads, and when police are being um, essentially um, uh, essentially fired. Um, I think that we've done a, a pretty good job at the point we're at, and I think that the public, during public testimony, we had over 170 people during three days talk to us about some of those cuts and what those would mean to their particular districts. Um, I think we're at the point where we've essentially right-sized government, and I think both Republicans in the House from previous years uh, weren't able to find cuts, and uh, this is where we're at today. So um, to answer your question, I think, I think that we're there, and I think that we're already seeing the effects uh, in the recession that we're currently at. I th and I think this, this week and into next week, uh, that whole conversation is going to play out further because this, the Senate is beginning in earnest there operating budget discussion with uh, uh, budget subcommittees beginning to hear agency budgets and so forth. And so that conversation with the public about how much uh, do you want cut out of uh, basic services and how much are you willing to sort of pony up vis-a-vis -vis the plan that our majority coalition has offered up and I think others are interested around the state. Um, I think that conversation is going to take an additional step with the Senate's uh, promise to cut $300 million out of the budget. and. Uh, really, I think, make some tough choices about uh, services that people rely on, uh, uh, you know, in uh, the daily conduct of their lives. And so uh, I, I think it's a great question. It's an ongoing question. And, um, you, know, I, uh, you know, we look forward to uh, continuing the dialogue. And I can attest that um, I spent the last two weekends in Anchorage. The first one was the Anchorage Caucus, where over 400 people showed up 
to speak to uh, approximately 20 legislators that were in town for that session. Um, and over 90 of my constituents showed up at our district caucus this last um, weekend. And our constituents are generally in support of, of the direction that we're moving. Um, we, we polled them in an informal way, and they showed support for the um, uh, the, the revenue uh, direction that we're taking and for the amount of cuts that have already been made. Shauna Crandall, Alaska Education Update. Um, we're hearing a lot about education cuts. Are education cuts inevitable this year? Well, well, we've kind of looked at education cuts and trying to say how can we have those least impactful to the classroom? And that's where the school bond debt uh, question came from. Uh, how do we, you know, we do a, a base student allocation decrease, it comes directly out of the classroom. I mean, you're talking about laying off teachers because that's 80, 80 some percent of their budget. Um, and so how do we have education proceed? You know, our budget, we're forward funding education from 2017 draw, we're forward funding that. And we're also uh, reinstating the six and a half million dollar pupil transportation cut, which comes basically from the classroom as well. So, you know, we've been very concerned about it. We're, we're concerned that the Senate is focusing on base student allocation cuts, meaning mm -hmm. larger class sizes. That's all you can do. That's that's where all the money goes in the teachers. And so. Um, we're committed to sustaining education. Um, I'm not sure that that uh, idea will have an amendment process of the base student allocate of the uh, school bond debt reimbursement cut will be there. Um, we're considering that. We've been open to um, looking at that as one aspect of doing. Uh, I don't know that that'll stay in the budget or not, but we'll um, we'll see. As the, as the education chair, I've been saying that um, the children of this state should not be losing opportunities because the adults in the state can't get their budget act together. Um, uh, as a former school board member, I know how hard school districts work to make sure that lower grade classrooms are properly staffed so that kids can learn to read by the time they finish third grade, because we know that if they are not literate by the time they finish third grade, the, the chances of success in upper grades um, is very slim. Um, and I think the adults at this table are doing a great job of, of protecting education and making sure that our children have the opportunities that they deserve. Do you have a, Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network? Do you have any thoughts on how municipalities and school districts should uh, handle the uh, reduction if there were to be a reduction in the uh, debt reimbursement? Well, I guess that's for me, and and I'd just say that they're the only ones that have the ability. Uh, the schools. Um, districts don't have the ability to tax, don't have the uh, ability to bond, don't have the ability to really have deep reserves, uh, don't have the ability to go to uh, sales tax increases or anything else. So, you know, we hate passing um, cuts on to local municipalities, but they also have a mechanisms to um, uh, raise funds and to support their schools. So these are all um, things that their voters voted on. I mean, they all voted on the bonds. And so um, whether that all comes true or not is, you know, um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. <clears throat> you know, mun municipalities have been held harmless over the last couple of years as much as we could recognizing the fact that uh, we have this huge uh, deficit within the state budget and uh, recognizing that passing um, passing these passing basically passing these responsibilities on to local municipalities is a tough situation I remember as a member of the City Council a young member of the City Council when uh, Governor Murkowski at the time ended um, revenue sharing and that was not an easy thing to swallow. Uh, municipalities uh, have the ability to come up with, with revenues, um, but it's, it's, it's not right. And, it, and I, I just wanna say that, uh, you know, as a member of the Finance Committee, we're looking at Nichols now, trying to figure out how we can balance this budget. We've heard testimony that says we, we should try to cut the budget even further. And I think that 
I'm not sure if the public really is engaged quite yet about how that impacts individuals, how that impacts families, how that impacts taxpayers, and how that will impact um, their property taxes. But uh, we're, we're trying to do everything we can um, and, and being very sensitive, I think, to local communities at the same time, um, trying not to transfer the burden to those communities. Liz Rains with KTVA. Going back to the subject of education, we're noticing a trend with that department. The House Finance Committee has, um, uh, in the budget, put in some fun funds from the permanent funds earnings specifically for education. Um, there's also a, a bill to have an income tax that is directed towards education. Senator Click Bishop uh, introduced a bill yesterday that would have a lottery for education. And I'm wondering, do you see uh, education as a popular way to build support for some unpopular revenue choices? Well, per <clears throat> well, personally, I see education as one of our primary responsibilities in the state. Um, you know, that's our job. Um, and so I think that that's where we're coming from. And the question is, how do we provide a good education? Because if we don't have good educational opportunities in the state, what we're going to have is families leaving to, pr to get better educational opportunities in other states and driving the economy downward by losing people that want to have the best education system for their uh, kids is not something we want to see. So yes, we're, we're very dedicated to making sure. It's not only K-12, but we're also fully funding the pre-K that we can. So um, all the parents as teachers programs, the uh, pre-K, uh, several different programs that are in there that we're trying to make sure that those are um, all upheld because if we don't have good basis to start with, we're not going to have the, um, the citizens we want in the future. There are about 130,000 young people in the K-12 system statewide um, and another 10,000 in each, uh, uh, each year of, <coughs> of age from zero to five. Um, who uh, we have a constitutional obligation to, to provide a, an appropriate public school education. Um, we ha we've, uh, uh, Representative Kawasaki has a universal pre-K bill that has a, a pretty substantial fiscal note of approximately $51 million. That's not something we will be able to afford to do this year, but I'm committed to looking at all the ways that we are already spending money on the first five years of, of uh, the children in this state and how we can um, support more of them to be ready to take advantage of the investment that we make in them once they get to kindergarten. Um, this is for uh, the finance members. What uh, what are your plans right now for the uh, tax credits that have been vetoed in the past, and then the uh, debt that continues to accumulate? The obligation to well, um, the tax credits are, are a real problem. Uh, they are accumulating at a um, large rate. Uh, you know, we're basically paying 35 percent of all the investments on the North Slope. Um, last year we were able to, through House Bill 247, at least wind down the Cook Inlet um, credits, but um, we couldn't get Senate partnership on doing anything uh, on the North Slope, which have to be addressed. Uh, you can't get a sustainable comprehensive fiscal plan going forward if you have somebody else that can sit there with a shovel and, and dig a hole in your budget, because at 35 percent of whatever they uh, decide to invest, that comes right out of our budget. So how, you know, that's unsustainable. So on our side, we have, um, you know, House Bill 111 uh, that is trying to ramp down those credits. Somewhat similar, uh, some differences to what we had proposed and, and all the major uh, the current majority voted on to, uh, last time on House Bill 247, which would have ramped down those credits on the North Slope, uh, constricted them severely and uh, would have helped our budgetary sis, uh, situation. But remember that credits are um, the cashable credits. The cash is a third method that they can use for those credits. Our obligation is to give them a credit certificate that they can use to offset their future production taxes. And then there were other ways in which we said, okay, well, you can sell them to somebody else, other somebody that had a oil tax uh, liability, or uh, if we have the money 
and uh, fiscal situation, we can directly reimburse them. But our obligation is not to do cash credits. Our obligation is to give them a credit certificate that they can use to write off against future production taxes. Remember, that's what these are, is they're production tax credits. And um, so, anyway. The money that we owe is in certificates that they can apply to their future production tax credits. They have a way to monetize those on their future production tax. If they never go into production, uh, they're not going to have any production tax. But these are production tax credits, and that's the chief way in which our obligation lies, is to let them write those credits off against their future production taxes. Let me put this simply, you know, when I started in the legislature in 2007, we were putting out maybe $30 million worth of tax credits. Uh, we're currently $1.3 billion in tax credits um, and subsidies that we're giving to the industry. If you think about that as a department and growth in government, that is the largest single growth in government that we're doing. And uh, at a time when we're talking about uh, taking money from classrooms or uh, taxing folks or um, taking money away from troopers and public safety or maintenance. Um, that's the discussion. I'll say that uh, Representative Guerra um, and the House Resources Committee are looking closely into the tax credits and I think it's, it's a necessity uh, for this legislature to address this year. So, we'll, yeah, one more question. We'll go a little bit over here to accommodate that. On, on the issue of credits and a, and a fiscal plan, the Senate has indicated that um, that it that it wants to get a permanent fund bill and is you know it's sort of on track to to pass that soon if it can muster its sufficient support in that side. So I'm interested in the movement of bills and if that's what they're interested in and you still have a tax credit bill on your side, if you still have an income tax bill on your side, things that are important for your plan. Um, where sort of the leverage that you have to get them to consider that if they pass a permanent fund bill and consider their work largely complete? Well, I guess the first thing I'd say is we're going to hold firm to our commitment to standing true to the four pillars that we have uh, sort of put out since day one. And one of those four pillars is, uh, uh, as uh, Representative Kawasaki and Representative Seaton have just, uh, I think, described in detail, uh, is oil tax credits and uh, reforming uh, 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 incentives that clearly are not sustainable and cannot be afforded by the state's treasury. So we plan to stand firm with that. We plan to stand firm with um, House Bill 115, which is in the House Finance Committee, which I think will get consideration once the operating budget uh, is, is through the committee. And uh, where that uh, sort of arrives in terms of the Senate's priorities and how the rest of the session plays out, um, you know, as I say, time will tell. But, uh, but uh, our message is that uh, we are committed to a comprehensive fiscal plan and uh, to, uh, to uh, new revenues as well as uh, uh, the restructuring of the permanent fund, uh, the smart budget cuts you s that you're seeing emerging from House Finance Committee as, as well as uh, uh, the oil tax credit and the reform needed there. These are not simple um, policy issues to tackle and uh, there, a lot of them are big picture items. And, uh, you know, um, uh, I think like I've said, every uh, press conference we've had here, our dialogue with the Senate, uh, with the House minority, uh, with the governor's office, I think has been pretty constructive amidst all these differences uh, that uh, you see with uh, uh, the Senate's uh, uh, fiscal plans, the House fiscal plans, what the governor may want, and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. So with that, thank you, everyone. We'll see you uh, next week, same time and same place. <laughs>